You're listening to the Orange Power Podcast, a product of Oklahoma State Athletics. Here are your hosts, Jessica Morey and the voice of the Cowboys, Dave Hunzike. The Cowboys at TCU coming up on a blackout Saturday night at Boone Pickett Stadium. Coach Gundy here, and you've had a lot of teams in position over the years, you know, in this spot, ranked in the top 10, lots of opportunity. Have you noticed that this team handles all of that any differently than some of the others you've had? Over the last few weeks, they've done really well. And, and that's really the, uh, the blueprint for the future. It, it doesn't start getting a lot of national attention until the middle of October is when people start thinking about it. So up to that point, they, they have been business as usual. Um, this team is, um, will we'll, we'll get an, a rating of A from their preparation standpoint. And, and you and I had talked earlier, there's not a first or second, maybe even a third round pick on this team. Yeah. So they prepare well, they've stayed focused, they, they're disciplined, and they like each other. It's so important today. They, they want to play hard and compete for each other. They have fun out there at the games. You watch them, they're smiling. Even in games when we've not played as well and been behind, they're still competing. So th that's really enjoyable for a coach. To what extent can you identify those qualities in recruiting? These guys have pretty much grown up together, <clears throat> right. and we're seeing this pretty special, unique chemistry. C can you really identify that, or is it something that happens more when they get here? I think that you can identify some of it, but we miss in those areas because if we take 20 players a year, we want 20 of them to have that characteristic about them. Mm -hmm. We want them to enjoy the game. We want them to compete, be unselfish, and be disciplined. At times, that makes up for talent level. And it also creates a really good culture, which is, which is important. Sure. Uh, we could have lost two or three more games this year if it wasn't for our culture and guys understanding commitment and stay focused and discipline and just keep playing and, and ignore the outside conditions. And in recruiting, if you dig really deep, you can find that information out, but it's not 100%. Yeah, understood. So obviously we've progressed into the part of the season where everybody knows everybody else. Mm -hmm. As far as now your opponents – certainly have had the opportunity to scheme you on both sides mm -hmm. of the ball. What have you been most happy about in, in terms of your team managing that part of it? Because some teams get off to great starts and then suddenly they right. get schemed up and they just go in the tank. That's hardly been the case with your team. I think coaching today at, at our level is understanding that fine line of how much do we do every Saturday that is new to, uh, to offset the team we're playing, and then how much do we just stay with what we've accomplished because we know what we're doing. We've had a lot of reps on it, we believe in it, and it's kind of who we are, just like the teams we're playing. If, if the players work hard during the week and study videotape, they're going to have a good idea of what's going to happen because there's not enough time during the week on a Tuesday and Wednesday for any of the schools to, to re- to, to change who they are and become something different. Yeah. And what you're referring to is exactly right. And so I would say our coaches have done a good job this year of trying to stay on the cutting edge, but also not getting away from the foundation of who we are. Are you seeing the progress in the passing game that you'd like to see? We're getting better there. Uh, we, you know, we got set back at West Virginia. We had, I don't know, three or four penalties where we're in long yardage situations. And it's not a secret. I mean, that's not a strength for us right now. Uh, that's not where we want to be. Teams know that. Um, we, we have to be more disciplined and eliminate those situations and, for lack of a better term, stay on the chains. That's kind of who we are on offense at this time. It's interesting with your opponent, TCU. They beat Baylor, upset the Bears in Fort Worth mm -hmm. last week. They've had their share of struggles. Obviously, Gary Patterson and TCU have parted ways. But does their overall talent really get your attention and, and maybe give you reason for concern because you, you look at some of those guys, especially on defense, they may have some guys picked in the first two yeah. or three rounds. So, so where does that kind of leave you? Because you look at some of their guys and it's like, 
wow, if they ever get going, kind of get in sync, they could be much better than their record, right? They are very athletic, and they've got a guy, they've got a player that's going to be picked in the first round or two, in my opinion. They have two others that could be gone by the fourth round. Yeah. So um, it, it, it's been an unusual year for them, in my opinion, just an outsider looking in, in that the games they've lost, they've had six or eight plays that cost them a lot. The other 60 plays of the game, they were just fine. Sometimes you have years like that. We, we've had teams that we look back at the game and there was three or four plays that just took us out of the game. And other than that, we played pretty good and we could have won. And that's really what's happened to them. They could very easily have had two more wins. Uh, and you know what, Dave, the truth is, if you look at the teams in our league, there's pretty much every team in our league could have two more wins or two more losses. Yeah. And, and we're in that boat too. I mean, it's not like this. a lot of the games we won were by 20 points. Right. So, and, and even the team that's – the, Oklahoma is leading our conference now. Oklahoma had three games they won in the last two or three minutes of the game. Mm -hmm. So, the team that's in first in our league right now is in the same boat as teams that may be in the bottom half of our league that only have four wins. They could very easily have had six at this time. So – but that's what's making it fun for the fans. It's miserable on the coaches, but it's making it fun for the fans. Studying pro football focus this week, TCU by far is the most aggressive team in the Big 12 throwing long passes, mm -hmm. taking deep shots, that is passes of 20 yards or more. To what extent does that concern you? And to what extent are you maybe excited to see how your defense holds up against that? They're gonna, they wanna throw it down the field and give themselves chances to get big plays which all of us do, and, and really that's smart football. Um, you know, if you out jump somebody and catch it and he falls down, you run in the end zone, you get a 60-yard free play compared to uh, just methodically driving down the balls. It is difficult in college football today. It's getting more difficult each season because of the parity. It's almost like the NFL, like what you and I talked about. College football is, is somewhat becoming the NFL offensively. Where, where the NFL now is running more college offenses and they're, they're becoming a little bit more like us. Yeah. Now, they're not scoring 50 and 60 points like we did in college, but they're, they're getting up there in the low 40s and 30s like they didn't used to. So um, it's changing. And, uh, you know, we just have to, to try to stay with what got us to this point. Yeah, fair enough. Defensively, again, the, the numbers – have not been near what TCU's defensive numbers normally are. Mm -hmm. However, they've had some guys hurt. There's a lot more to that puzzle mm -hmm. than just looking at stats will tell you, right? They're really good in the back end. They, they've got a, a young man, I think, is going to be a, maybe a first or second round pick at corner who's been out for a while. He's been back a couple weeks. He makes a big difference. I'm guessing that uh, they'll play him on Tay Martin. And then um, – I would think they feel like that they've been a little more vulnerable to the run than what they've liked in just in, in Gary's past. Uh, and I know he's not there anymore, but he's still game planning for them and, and, and I would say very, very involved with their defense. So um, they've given up more points than what has been their history. But I will say this, again, I go back to, it's been about eight plays a game in the games they've lost that have hurt them defensively, in my opinion. We'll honor Barry Sanders this weekend mm -hmm. and unveil the statue of arguably the greatest running back that ever lived. Mm -hmm. So if he were to play today, what would, he ha what would he do? What would it be like? Well, in these style of offenses, with the amount of plays that are run, uh, he would it'd be pretty safe to say he could probably rush for 4,000 yards. 4,000? Wow. Yeah, he rushed for, what, 2,800 or mm -hmm. 30? Well, I can't remember what he rushed for. The, his, his uh, I think, 2,800 maybe his. And that was playing football inside the hash marks with three yards and a cloud of dust. With the space that these running backs get now and get the ball, when he got in, when he got in space, you can go over and go back and pull the 16-millimeter tape and look at it. When he got in space, people didn't have a chance, even when he was in Detroit. And, and he played in Detroit with just, you know, a very, very average team at best and a very average offense at best. You know, I often think what would he have done at the same time if he was uh, 
playing for Dallas behind that line like Emmett Smith. Yeah. So uh, there's not any doubt that he was the greatest college running back ever. And when you get to the NFL, you're going to put five, six, seven guys up there. He's in that group. I don't even think it's worth debating. You know, people debate who's better, Montana or um, Tom Brady. I, I don't know. They're both really good. I think he's in that category in the NFL. But in college, there's not anybody that's accomplished what he did in just a short amount of time. As a teammate of Barry Sanders, what was something about him, probably beyond football, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. that you really admired as a quality of his? Well, he's very humble. From day one, he was very humble um, and didn't feel like he was entitled to anything, even the Heisman Trophy. Um, but he worked hard. He was short and was not really given a chance until he got here. And so he always had, I don't think he felt this way, but he had a chip on his shoulder even though he didn't, didn't know he had a chip on his shoulder. And that allowed him to have great work ethic. He stayed humble all the time. You know, he's a very unusual person from the standpoint that if he's in an, uh, an environment where he's comfortable, he talks and laughs and has a good time. If he's in an environment where he's not sure, he doesn't say anything. Mm -hmm. And that's where, for years, the media never really could get to know him because that's not something that he enjoyed. He just was not, he felt like people were um, putting him on a pestle, and he didn't feel comfortable with that, is what I saw. And he liked to play pickup basketball. Uh, I think if you asked him, he would rather have been an NBA player than an NFL player. Did he you tell me he could dunk? Pardon me. Oh, yeah, he dunked. He went, he'd go over in the Colvin Center and play pickup basketball during our years here, and he dunked. Wow. Um, and, and uh, you know, he loved candy, and he loved cookies. Um, he, he would just as soon eat... Um, a bunch of candy as he would a steak dinner and he could fall asleep any place any time in a matter of about 90 seconds like he slept most of our half times he would go sit in his locker and lean lean back his head and would sleep you know for 10 minutes or so and then you know three or four minutes before we had to go out and wake him up and he'd go back out uh, he fell he, he fell asleep on the bench in between series one time you know what's funny about that? Tiger Woods did that. He would take yeah. like that 60 second power nap, mm -hmm. you know, on a tee box when play was held up. We're talking about two of the greatest yeah. of all time in their sports. And yeah. I, I don't know what that says, but that's unique. Maybe it's the ability to, to, to re-energize mentally. I don't know. Put his mind to rest, but he liked to, he, he loved to sleep. Um, there was a number of times he was asleep at halftime and we didn't tell him anything anyway. I mean, he already had 250 yards rushing, and, and uh, we were so simple back then. Uh, but very humble, uh, very appreciative of everything that he had. And, um, you know, there's just no doubt that when it comes to a guy that had the ball in his hands running the football at this level, uh, nobody could really compare to him. Coming up, we'll sit down with Cowboy Head Men's basketball coach Mike Boynton. Stay with us. It's time for Ask the Coach, presented by Academy Sports and Outdoors. Hey, Coach Gunny, this is Slade. What's your favorite way to spend an open week on the schedule? In most cases, I'm with my boys doing something. They're involved in activities, could be playing a sport, could be at a practice. Uh, sometimes, if, uh, if it allows, maybe I go hunting with them. Uh, in the afternoon, I usually cook. Um, the TV will run with games on it but I don't, just, I don't necessarily really watch it much. I just kind of see certain things. Um, I, I don't really care to watch games when I'm not coaching them because that's what I do all the time. Unless I have a genuine interest or I'm taking notes on something. Um, but I cook um, a big pot of new potatoes, uh, peppers, um, green beans, okra, different things. I put it all together and um, fry it and then boil it and all that. So I enjoy doing that. Academy Sports and Outdoors is your Nike headquarters. We are proud to offer the best and newest Nike apparel, footwear, and sports equipment. From football to baseball, basketball to soccer, and everything in between, Academy is your place for Nike. For back to school and back to the field, head to toe, your home for Nike is Academy Sports and Outdoors. 
There are a great many things that can be found on the road. A giant blue whale in central Oklahoma. Musicians in search of that perfect melody. You'll even discover the center of the universe. You'll find stories of lives led, challenges met, and men who raise pigeons. They're all out there waiting to be discovered. All you have to do is follow the road. Phillips 66. Live to the full. I wiped up a mess. Yeah, you... Where is the butt? Never mind, I found it! Welcome back, football fans. We'll see you in the fridge. Cowboy basketball is generating a lot of excitement, and after the way the Cowboys played in the opener and taking down UT Arlington, it's easy to understand why. Coach Boynton is with us. And in the opener, what things did you see that you were especially excited about? And maybe what's something that you saw that was good that you didn't expect? Well, I, I was really pleased, especially after watching the film, uh, probably in more, more ways than I thought during the game, how connected we were defensively. Uh, I thought our attention to detail and our ability to fly around and create havoc and really suffocate the other team's offense uh, was really impressive. Um, but these kids have been working really hard, so I wasn't surprised by that. I was just happy to see them get out there and compete with one another and kind of put the news of last week behind them. You know, it's interesting when you talk about the defense. You have a lot of players that have not played on this team before, and you have groups of players that haven't played a lot of minutes together, yet it appeared you were very connected defensively did it surprise you to see that you know just after one exhibition game and in your regular season opener the extent that that seemed to be true yeah a little bit but it was probably a byproduct of we've got a lot of guys who've played together before yeah that are back with us and then even the guys who are new to our system are new to college basketball yeah and so that that kind of um um return of of knowledge and experiences was certainly beneficial to us getting off to a good start and understanding preparation and game plan and things of that nature. You talked about getting last week past you. So moving forward, what is the right context that you want your players to carry with them based on the news that you will not be able to play in the postseason? Well, you know, we always talk about it, but it's, it's probably even more consequential this year that we live in the moment, that we really embrace every day that we have together um, because as it stands right now, it is a finite amount of time, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we kind of know what the end date is for this team at this point. So as we'll continue to fight to see if we can find a better outcome for the guys, we want them to understand that not take any day for granted. Go out there and play as, much, as hard as you can for each other and represent Oklahoma State the best way we can. What else can they learn from all of this? You know, I, I really believe it's, it's, it's a couple things. One is, you know, decisions have consequences and sometimes even those decisions that you weren't necessarily a part of but now that you're by relation connected to can certainly affect you uh, but also it's a great lesson in the ability to control the things that you truly can control and that's where we are now uh, there are a lot of things out of out my staff and our players control but what's not out of our control is our attitude every day, uh, the ability to b buy in and believe in one another, and to try to become the best version of what we're capable of as a team. And uh, I think last night was a little glimpse into what we can possibly become. A glimpse of something else that was positive in the opener was Musa Cisse. Transferred in from Memphis in the summertime, had 17 points and a couple of block shots, believe six rebounds in a game. What did you see out of him that maybe surprised you. Of course, he's shown a lot in practice. I, maybe there wasn't anything, but obviously that early second half surge he had, and we had seven points in like two and a half minutes was impressive. Yeah, his growth in the game in the short amount of time he's been with us has been, you know, astronomical in many ways. I mean, when he got here, he was never clumsy, but he was really, really rushed. Um, he pl tried to play fast. He tried to do everything, every possession. And now the game is starting to slow down for him, both offensively so that he can make better reads. Uh, he was seven for eight from the field. Because of that, he made most of his free throws, especially early. Uh, and then defensively, right, a shot blocker sometimes can be reckless. 
and he didn't have any reckless moments blocking shots. They were all pretty well timed. And even though only two showed up on the stat sheet, I would imagine he affected five or six more at minimum. You made the comment in the postgame radio show, something that carried over from last year is Rondell Walker, who may not fill up the stat sheet with a lot of points necessarily, but I think he had four steals, but it seemed like he had 14. I mean, just the way the game was going and how he impacts things defensively, and he always seems to be in the opponent's way <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. No, there's no doubt. And he takes great pride in that. And, and that's a big part of being a really good defensive player is caring, right? That's a big part of it. And, and having an understanding that that's a valuable part of the game for your team. Uh, and so his numbers don't always jump off the page at you. But if you watch our team play, you know that he's had a great impact on our team's ability to have success. Keelan Boone came off the bench and really gave you a spark. Of course, you were thriving defensively early and making it difficult. So he added some fuel to what was already burning very positively. I think he had eight points in the first half and, and scored in double figures with 10. How important is that for him? And he was impacting the game on the glass, too, I might add. How important is it for him? to have that great game to start the year, given the fact that last year he had moments where he was good, some other times where he struggled. How, how much can that really help him? Yeah, he's a junior now. And so the expectation is, is that he can be a consistent contributor for us. And we're not asking him to go out and get 20 points a night for us. We're asking him to bring the same competitive edge, uh, rebounding tenacity, and occasionally make an open three or two. And, and certainly he's capable of doing all that. Uh, but the thing that was most impressive to me was that his defense led the charge. His effort led the charge. He had a couple steals and several offensive rebounds that really got him going. And we talk about it all the time. The more you give to, to your teammates and to the game, the better it comes back to you. And his reward for making selfless plays early was he was confident and comfortable stepping in and making open shots. And it's certainly something that our team needed at the time. Something that I think will get opponents' attention is it seems you have a ton of interchangeable parts that gives you flexibility offensively and defensively. Yeah, um, it's been a treat in practice to watch these guys compete against one another and to try to figure out the, the chemistry, if you will. Uh, and so that's an evolving process still, uh, but it's a great luxury to have because you're not as concerned about foul trouble, so to speak. You're not as concerned about whether a team's going to try to slow you down because over the course of the game, we feel like our depth and our versatility can be huge, huge weapons for us. Speaking of your depth, the status of Caleb Boone, he's been bothered by, I guess, a shoulder injury. When do you expect him back in games? You know, he, he's trending to come back pretty soon and maybe miss one more game. Uh, but he looks like he's getting more comfortable with his reps in practice and certainly hope to have him here before the end of the week. Stay with us. Jessica talks cowgirl basketball with OSU head coach Jim Littell when we return. Hello, sweet babies. Welcome to your new home. You have changed our life, and you may even change the world. And because of you, 2021 is the best year ever. Mercy has helped moms deliver babies for nearly 200 years. To find out how to welcome your baby at Mercy, visit mercy.net slash osumom. At OGND, the energy we deliver is more than electrical. We energize education by supporting schools to help our children reach their potential. So every time you see Big Orange out there working for you, remember we're also working to turn power into empowerment. Because at OGND, we do more than energize a power grid. At OGND, we energize life. Welcome back to the Orange Power Podcast. I'm Jessica Mori, and I am joined by Cowgirl Basketball Head Coach Jim Littell. Coach, you guys opened up the season last night with a Power 5 battle against Colorado. It was a tough game for you guys coming away with the loss 55-45. to We'll touch on that game just real quick. Uh, what did you see from your team in that game? Well, we, we saw a lot of things we needed to work on. You know, typically you play – a lesser opponent to start out and we wanted to challenge our team and see what we needed to work on. We know we've got a young team, we've got some newcomers, we got some people that are having to assume a different role. So we wanted to make sure we saw what we needed to get better on before we continued our schedule. So very tough opponent, good basketball team, very experienced 
And uh, we found out some things that we needed to work on, which I think will make us better down the road. What were some of those things? Well, we our execution offensively wasn't real good last night. We've got to trust and stay within what we do. I didn't think we ran the floor as well as we had previously. Uh, another thing is that uh, we had some defensive lapses, but uh, those are all things that are fixable, and our kids will see it on film the next day. And this year's team is a little different than your teams in the past. Um, you always kind of had that one star, whether it's Vivian Gray or Tasha Mack or even Jamie Asbury. But this year, uh, everyone's kind of on, on a level playing field, and, and you want – you know, in each game to have four or five girls in double figures, not just one that's going to score 20 every game. You would like that, though. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> but um, kind of what's the identity of this year's team? Well, I think it's got to be, you and I talked about this uh, yesterday, it's got to be collective. We've got to have a lot of kids get in that 8 to 10 to 12 point range and, you know, play within the limits and do what they're capable of doing. And we don't have that prolific score that we've had in the past. So, Everybody's got to be able to assume to, to, to take a step up from what they did. Their responsibilities and what's expected of them is going to be higher this year. And what did you like from Lauren Fields in this past game? You mentioned to me before the game that she's probably one of your most improved and she knows what to expect. And, uh, you know, she was out there playing physical and making plays when she needed to. Well, she played with no fear. You could tell that she'd been out there. She uh, probably has more on-court experience than anybody that we have on the floor. She's played in big settings in the NCAA tournament, the Big 12 tournament, and, and had a nice career so far. And she's just continuing to get better each year. And uh, I liked her aggressiveness. Uh, she was in passing lanes. Uh, she was aggressive when she touched the ball. And uh, that's what I most liked about her game. And, uh, you know, Full capacity back at Gallagher Iba Arena this year. Uh, the crowd, not bad last night, but again, there was bad weather in the area, so that could have affected it as well. But what's it like getting to be back out there and play in front of that crowd at GIA? Well, our players have commented about it that it's a, just a lot better atmosphere. It was really strange last year. I don't know how to describe it, and I don't think our kids knew how to take it either. So uh, it's nice to get back to some form of normalcy, and uh, we appreciated the people. Uh, despite some of the weather conditions coming out to watch us and just need somebody to bring a friend and let's uh, let's get more people in GIA. Yeah, definitely. And uh, if you can't make it to GIA, you can obviously watch um, most of the games on ESPN Plus or listen to them on the radio. And there's a new addition to the broadcast staff in um, Latricia Trammell coming on to be a color analyst. And she's the current assistant coach for the Los Angeles Sparks. So that's really cool to have a current WNBA assistant watching every single one of your games, watching all of your girls play. Um, you know, kind of talk to me about how special that is to, to have that and how it, you know, can give you guys an advantage. Well, she's fully vested in what she's doing, and, and uh, she is uh, a young lady that wants to do well, whether she's coaching or whether she's doing uh, the work with Casey, and a uh, very knowledgeable, uh, fantastic person that uh, has, uh, you know, taking the time to visit with our players. She comes to practice every now and then. And it's just somebody that knows the game and can understand what's trying to go on. And a and, uh, wonderful person. And we feel very fortunate that she's on, on board with us. Yeah, I think it's uh, you know great to have her there. I was doing sideline for that game last night, and I just listened to her. I'm learning all kinds of things because she is so knowledgeable, and she just brings a different perspective, which I thought was really cool. Um, so next game for you guys is at SMU. That's noon on Sunday. And then you'll be back home against Missouri State November 17th. That's Wednesday at 630. That is the 10-year anniversary of the plane crash that killed former head coach Kurt Butkey, um, assistant Miranda Serna, and the brand setters. Uh, for you, 10 years, I mean, kind of just what's going to be going through your mind for that game? Well, there's, I'm sure it's going to be very emotional and, and – uh, Coach is someone I think about every day. Uh, a lot of people don't know that he, uh, besides me working for him, he was uh, my best friend, best man in my wedding. His wife played for me. And uh, 
our kids grew up together. So, you know, um, it, we've always been great around here, remembering the 10 and now remembering the four, and that will never change. And this is going to be, uh, there's going to be some major college coaches, Hall of Fame coaches that are giving some comments about Coach and what he meant to them, what he meant to Oklahoma State, his players, and the game of women's basketball. So I think it's going to be a special night and uh, would love to have our crowd turn out, all of our crowd turn out and, and pay honor to, to those four uh, wonderful people that made a huge impact on uh, Oklahoma State. Yes, I agree with that on Wednesday, Missouri State, and that will be at 6.30. So Cowgirl fans and all fans should come out and support the Cowgirls in that game. That is the next home game for Oklahoma State women's basketball as well. well thank you so much for joining me, Coach Littell. We will be right back here on the Orange Power Podcast next week. We'll see you then.